Hello and welcome to the Danetcast podcast. I am your host, Francisco Chavez, and today I'm delighted to tell you we have a special guest. This guest I will introduce later in the episode, and we will discuss the Danetka of today with this special guest. The Danetka of today is called One Note Concert. A man played only one note during the entire concert. The audience came on purpose to see him play. I will now describe the picture. As you know, every Danetka comes accompanied with a picture. And this picture shows a person carrying an instrument and a bow. Uh, the instrument seems like a kind of violin, but a bit bigger and he carries it in a weird way. So why did the man play only one note? Who was the man? And why did the audience come to see him play? Do you have any thoughts already? I will now start by reading the Rigolettos, the secret hints. We have four hints. The first one says, I play one note, they play more. This is a very helpful hint, I think, because it shows us that even though it's the one note concert, other people played more notes. Only this man played one note. So very helpful first Rigoletto. Second one. Let me play. It's an order. Hmm, someone ordered to play. Who gives orders? You have any thoughts? Third Rigoletto. At least today all he wanted was music. Last time he ordered a sculpture in his honor. So today this person wanted music. But last time he ordered a sculpture. Hmm, who orders sculptures? Fort Rigoletto. I didn't know being a musician was that easy. Do you have any guesses to what might have happened? Feel free to pause and figure out for yourself the Danetka. I will now read the answer. One note concert. The King of England ordered English composer Henry Purcell to write a piece where he could take part. It was a big challenge as the King was not a musician. Purcell came up with a genius idea. He wrote an orchestral piece where the king had to repeat the same note on the viola many times, always with the same simple rhythm. Everybody came to see the king play. Musicologists still debate why Purcell wrote this piece, Fantasia upon one note, with only one note in the viola part. Let's now listen to this uh, masterwork by Purcell, the Fantasia upon one note. And then I will introduce our special guest for today. We will listen to Experion 20 Ensemble, directed by Jordi Saval.
I would now like to introduce my special guest, Ivote Tadese. She's a violist in uh, Zagreb, Croatia, and we will talk a bit about the viola, this fascinating instrument. Hello, Ivote. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, good. Nice to be here and to talk a bit about uh, the instrument and um, and everything it has to offer, some cool stories. So what do you think about this story, about the king playing uh, Purcell's uh, Fantasia, only doing one note the entire time? I mean, I would do this concert, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Seems like a very, very well-paid gig. <laughs> <laughs> With a lot of attendance? Yeah. <laughs> So you wouldn't mind just playing one note the entire concert? Sounds good. Sounds relaxing. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. Finally, you know, you can chill. <laughs> so let, let's talk a bit about the viola. Like, how did you start playing the viola, or did you start with the viola? Mm -hmm. Did you start with another instrument? Uh, well, back in my day, which was in the beginning of two thousands, there wasn't really a school for little violists. You know, you had to start on the violin. So I did, and not even knowingly, viola was a thing. And then my teacher, she was actually a viola player. And uh, when it was time to head to high school, musical high school, she suggested I play the viola. And I didn't care much about the violin. So it was basically, you know, why not? Let's try something else. And a uh, good thing I did, uh, because when I started playing it, I finally discovered uh, everything that I that I love about music. It was um as if i found my my voice you know um and then i really started uh practicing a lot uh researching the sound you know um it was just like a very inspiring moment for me uh this switch uh, that i made when i was i think 13 or 14 and ever since then i've been playing the viola and now you basically do your uh your living playing the viola in the in the orchestra Yes, uh, I work in the Zagreb Philharmonic Orchestra, where I'm the principal violist of, of the orchestra, which means basically I have to uh, lead the section, okay. uh, which is uh, made of around, in average, 10 or 12 players. And basically, I'm just responsible for, you know, the communication between leaders, writing bowings up, down, up, down. And um, maybe uh, we can clarify uh, for, for uh -huh. our listeners, what does it mean? Because I know what it means to write the bowings, but maybe for our listeners, mm -hmm. what does it mean to, to write the bowings? Basically, you all have to bow the same way. Yeah, I could explain the best with a story. So when I was a child, my grandpa was obsessed with watching you know like the uh vienna philharmonics concerts on new year's and uh, he would uh, always say oh my god how can they play on the same part of the bow it's so impressive <laughs> like yes. 100 people playing exactly on the same part of the bow how do they do it you know and basically my job now is to make that happen so Yes. I need to really observe how the first stand of the first violin plays. And uh, basically, there are two options. The bow can either go up or down. And we have specific markings uh, for that. Uh, that's for direction. Then if we're talking about articulation, uh, then I also just observe if he's playing uh, really long notes, short notes, how much bow he's using. And I'm just trying to copy it uh, at you know at, at this at the spot and uh, if we have something with other groups so with cellies or with uh, double basses or with a uh, second violins then i would speak directly to the leaders of the section and we would kind of make a compromise is is that a big topic in the orchestra like if people disagree on the bowing do you get angry and uh, uh, anxious and is there a big drama in the orchestra about the bowings actually if you disagree with your colleagues well honestly uh, no not really uh, sometimes I feel like I'm very like strong I have a strong opinion about this bow I'm not really easy on changing it um, then there are two options uh, the first option is uh, just let the conductor decide <laughs> <laughs> like in a match you know somebody has to decide you can't yes. sometimes you can't let the players decide yes and um and the second option is like i don't know to give in because uh we had a really great teacher in uh, maastricht 
Yeah. He was a chamber music teacher, Hank Hita, who uh, played his whole life in a quartet. And he said uh, that you are the best musician when you can actually uh, work for the ideas of other musicians around you, when you can take them as wholeheartedly as you would take your own idea. So sometimes I, I take this approach. That's, that's um, very good. So you have to really adapt yourself to other musicians, basically. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you because I just uh, wanted to enter a bit into details about the Boeings uh, because, mm -hmm. like, uh, many people don't know what is what is actually uh, like what it involves to write a Boeing for uh, for the orchestra, right? Of course, yeah. And let's say about this story about the fact that the viola has simple parts or easier parts. Do you feel that there is a, like an evolution in the repertoire that the the viola music becoming increasingly hard or not that much? Um, I do I do think that there is a certain trend that goes in this direction, but um, I think it feels with I, I feel like it happens with all of the instruments. The viola story is kind of specific in this way because in the early days, so let's say in the Renaissance and the early Baroque periods, and also in, in French Baroque music, you would actually have two viola parts, and also like the middle parts were often considered the most important parts. Not the basso. Yeah, like some sources would say that the what in England they would call the mean um, is what actually makes the music uh, come together. And you had two different uh, violas. You had a small size viola and a large size viola. And then, like with the evolution of I don't know trio sonata, which um, is basically a piece of music that usually doesn't require uh, a middle voice and um, with the whole movement of uh, of the classical period where you don't have a, a lot of uh, polyphonic anymore, um, uh, then the, the music kind of gets easier on us. Uh, I would put easier really in brackets <laughs> because still what, what you have to do there is pretty hard, uh, which we can talk about later, uh, why easy parts are some, sometimes really hard to play. And then progressively we have uh, in the Romantic period until now uh, really difficult uh, music written for, for orchestral viola uh, sections. Just last week we played an incredibly hard uh, piece, uh, Sibelius Third Symphony. Any violists, uh, if you haven't played this yet, be warned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for There's all violists... A, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were announcement. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, they're really tricky bits and pieces, of course. Uh, this week we are playing Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra, and um, oh, I love that! I love that. Yeah. Concert. Oh my god, that's it's good. it's and great. Bartok, and but, Bartok, yeah. Bartok has great stuff for viola, right? Yes, he has a viola concerto that uh, he actually uh, was writing on his deathbed. Uh, and actually didn't finish in the end. Uh, many composers died composing for the viola, so also oh. composers be warned. <laughs> <laughs> so I shouldn't start writing a viola concerto right now. <laughs> yeah, better not. <laughs> we will now take a small break from the interview to listen to this viola concerto from Bartok that Ivote just mentioned. We will listen to Ivote herself playing the Viola Concerto from Bela Bartok. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I find it very interesting that you said uh, that in England, the middle part was the mo most important because um, as a guitarist, I played uh, like this early Baroque Renaissance music. We had what we called the basso continuo and we would mm -hmm. read just the bass line and then uh, we would have the melody. And I remember when I was playing that repertoire, there was no middle voice, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe the, the traditions differ from country to country. Well, um... The thing is, there uh, there were several debates about um, like who was first. So why is it the violin or why is it the viola or you okay. know? And one of the biggest arguments for uh, for viola being the first instrument from which the other other instruments uh, came to be about was the fact that the tenore part was so so important. Um, I forgot all of the sources, but uh, that was one of the that was one of the key elements. Unfortunately, neither is true. So it was not uh, the chicken or the egg. It was basically a, a f first instrument that was the source for all of the other string instruments. Um, which yeah, it's called lira da braccio, and it's kind of like an ancestor to everybody. So nobody can claim oh, we were first. <laughs> and, and this lira da braccio, you would play with the bow? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, why do you think then easy parts are hard to play? What makes easy parts hard to play? <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, as viola players, we're often entrusted with, uh, let's say, the keeping of of tempo. Um, you have a certain passage and it seems kind of simple, but um, until you realize that uh, there are a bunch of other groups that you are kind of responsible for and you are the heart of. Um, and you know, a symphony orchestra is very big, spread out, um, and it's not always that easy to, uh, to hear even, you know, or to make the, uh, to make what you're doing uh, audible and visible and that's where we come in um we are kind of the glue between the between different groups i i have the feeling that often this is our our job you know or to um with some i don't know with some accompaniment to make it as beautiful as inviting for the soloist to then or that he or he or she can then build up on this you know um it's a lot of uh adjusting and then also like not giving back yeah it's kind of uh kind of like a, a play constantly okay where then you're, you're literally yeah. in the middle exactly <laughs> <laughs> we're the stuffing <laughs> the stuffing the stuffing of the cake okay and and do you think that there is a, a lack of uh, violists or do you think that there is a lot of competition uh because Actually, the orchestra has more violins than violas, but there are also more violin players than viola players. What do you think about the ratio? Do you have a lot of viola students in the music schools, in the conservatories? Well, uh, in Croatia, still the situation is kind of uh, that there are really not that many good good violists. Uh, we're like always looking for <laughs> for more, um, even though the situation is really improving. Um, if if we're thinking like uh, 20 years back, 30 years back. Um, but um, I don't know. I think it's going in a really, you know, in a really good direction. Mm, I'm just thinking about the recent auditions we have and like we hired a violist, but we didn't hire a violin player, you know. So it's, yeah, okay. it's, it's hard. It's hard to say. And it also really depends on the years. Some years there are five great viola players coming out of the academy and then uh, for 10 years there's nobody you know it's like oh, okay so it's very uh, irregular yeah that that's basically the problem i would say and how does um, actually uh, viola education changed throughout the years well since i was in school they uh, they started having also um, kids enrolling on the day one on the viola they found uh, the instruments and all the the gear and uh, it's so cute to see so you can do that and of course if you just uh, start and as an adult, as an adult uh, if you're interested sure you can also play um the viola uh in instantly uh but um you know the generally uh viola education wasn't that good until i would say in the middle of the 20th century 
because like even uh, Berlioz was complaining in his diaries that it's just unbelievable that there is no uh, viola professor at the university or, or the French uh, or Paris conservatory, you know. Oh, wow. okay, that's very uh, interesting. That's in Berlioz time, you know, and like... Um, Okay. <laughs> Just to add a contextual note to Ivota's words, Berlioz was a French composer born in 1803, so in the 19th century. Paris has been, as many of you know, the capital of the arts and an important artistic center. So after the viola has been played for hundreds of years, to not have a viola professor in one of the most artistic cities in the world seems unbelievable. So I, I think we came a long way and there were several important figures that actually uh, made the viola Cinderella no more. Uh, we have uh, two big giants, uh, Lionel Tertis. Uh, he's, uh, he was in Tertis, yeah. Tertis. He was an English... Uh, violist uh, and uh, a teacher who raised a number of great viola players who then like spread the word and uh, William Primrose who was just a su superlative uh, player and uh, also like people were experimenting with the uh, different sizes of the instruments Lanner Tertis has his uh, viola model uh, which was slightly uh, bigger in size and uh, in general, like there are there are many many different versions of the of the instrument just like uh, circulating around. There was this guy in Germany called uh, Hermann Ritter, uh, who had a large viola. I think he called it uh, viola alta. And uh, Wagner, when he first heard it, he just immediately invited him to to his festival uh, in Bayern to play principal principal violist. And he would Ritter also like uh, uh, actually taught a lot of uh, students in Germany. So you see, there were uh, some individuals who really made it happen for us. So it's not really the composers like writing repertoire. It's re because they they wrote. It's really the players that uh, spread out the instrument and the value of the instrument. The players. Yes, especially Paganini, for example. Uh, for two years, he almost gave up the violin completely and he was playing the viola. And he he was the one who came to Berlioz and said, like, I have this amazing Stradivari viola, but I have no music to play it, you know. So he asked him, like, could you please compose something? And then he wrote uh, Harold in Italy, which unfortunately Paganini uh, didn't want to didn't wanna play because he said there were too many rests, there's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then Berlioz just told him, okay, then you can just write your own concerto, which uh, he kind of did later. <laughs> Paganini wrote uh, a viola concerto. Yeah, it's called, I think, a grand sonata. Uh, it's not sonata for a grand viola. Uh, it's also, it's pretty difficult. He had this huge instrument. They say his hand was like completely elongated so he could play it. And he had really long hands. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, Paganini. But in general, the, the great story about this Harold in Italy, which is now maybe the most performed viola concerto, is that uh, in three years' time, Paganini heard it. And he was so moved by it that he kneeled before Berlioz and uh, kissed his hand and said it was the most amazing thing he ever heard, you know. So, like, he sent him a letter the day after with some cash, which Berlioz apparently really needed because he was sick and in financial struggles. So, yeah, a nice story, actually. That's a very, that's a very nice story. I think we talked a, a lot. Um, it, was, it was very interesting. I learned a lot. Okay, that's good, yes. <laughs> I guess. So, so <laughs> even if the listeners uh, don't like it, for me, it was already worth it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. Yes, and I wish you a big success in, um, in Zagreb and uh, all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. To finish the episode, we'll now listen to the piece that Ivote was talking about. Viola Concerto from Berlioz, Harold in Italy. We will listen to a small excerpt. Sir Colin Davis is conducting the Philharmonia Orchestra and on the viola is Baron Yehudi Menuhin. Thank you 
and see you on the next the netcast episode